Hi, my name is Tyra Turner and I am part of the Environmental Stewardship and Social Justice class here at UW-Madison and I'm here to talk to you about the mark left by redlining on Madison, Wisconsin and the United States. And I just want to be clear that this podcast is my bias, my experience and my research that I have done. Um, and so this is not a universal thing. This is, um, this is what I have created for you all to listen to. Um, so we will be talking about housing discrimination and the lasting effects that it had. So housing discrimination was very prominent in the 1900s and kind of how those effects still linger on today. So common misconception is that um, racism kind of ended with the civil rights movement or started to diminish when in reality, neighborhoods in, this, in cities are just as seg segregated today as they were in the 1900s. So in that sense, segregation did not end. Um, in education, maybe yes, but in neighborhood, neighborhoods and housing, no, it did not end. So despite laws and efforts to bring equality into neighborhoods, racial, class and racial and class segregation are still very prominent in housing in the United States due to a history of redlining, housing discrimination, and those lingering effects. So what is housing discrimination? Housing discrimination is any form of discrimination that prevents or makes it difficult for someone to buy or rent a house. So that could be in regards to race, gender, class, no matter what it is, any form of discrimination that prevents someone from buying this. So after the Great Depression in the 1900s, the Homeowners Loan Corporation or HOLC made residential security maps. So on these maps, they would kind of paint out a layout of the city and show the most desirable places to live or the most undesirable places to live. So there would be green areas. Green was the best, most affluent. That's where the majority of white people lived, um, or those neighborhoods were primarily white people, um, and they were just considered like the best in that sense. And then blue was kind of right next to that. Um, and then if you go farther down, the yellow areas de were deemed a little bit more undesirable. And then the red areas, which is where the um, most minorities and the lower class folks and um, like other black people and Latinx people would live. And these were deemed hazardous areas on the basis of race or class or whatever you would want to call it. And so these with these red areas, that's where the term redlining came from. So these um, zoned areas that were technically red. That's where we get redlining from. And it made it extremely difficult for people to um, get loans, um, buy a house, sell a house, and attend good schools due to taxes and that sort of thing. So these maps are what kind of allowed people to either get loans from the government or um, buy homes in certain areas. They would make these applications with um, really stereotypical words that were associated with black people. Um, like lazy or hazardous, like that sort of thing. Um, and those would be associated, like on the literal application for these loans um, back when discrimination in housing was legal. So we will see, we'll talk about the lasting effects of redlining in that sense. And this is where we kind of got covenants and ghettos from, um, from people um, of either the same like race or class would be kind of forced into these overcrowded areas and that's where we'd see those racial covenants of um, just people kind of living on top of each other in these really unsafe, um, unhealthy environments. Um, a lot of diseases were spread. It was very dangerous if there was a fire or something. People weren't able to get out. There weren't even windows in apartments, that sort of thing. It was just a lot of people living on top of each other um, and just a lot of overcrowding um, have going on in in these covenants. So in cities like New York, where unsafe housing and pollution is very common, there's obviously a lot of pollution in New York with all the cars, buildings, industries, that sort of thing, um, just people in general. So they're way more susceptible to illnesses such as asthma, for instance, which today asthma is the leading cause of school absence in New York because um, there's just so much pollution. There's so many people on top of each other. So you can kind of see how um, overcrowding and shoving people into one condensed space can kind of have those lasting effects on people to in order like for people to go as far as getting asthma and having to miss school for it and so frequently as well. So although housing discrimination was illegal, it still had very long lasting effects. So let's kind of talk about the HOLC maps in Madison specifically. 
So in Madison, the west side were the green and blue areas. Um, the isthmus, so right in between the lakes, that was mostly yellow, um, had some red spots. Otherwise, it was kind of unzoned, so there weren't really there wasn't really as much housing in that area, so we didn't really have zoning. And then the far east side was mostly yellow um, with red spots, and then the south side and north sides were both yellow and red primarily, with not as many green spots. You saw some green spots on the east side and south sides and north sides but those are mostly near the lakes and like these really beautiful areas where it was more expensive to live so it's really the only times that you saw those green and blue areas on the east side so the city centers are typically the older spots and that is where more of those yellow and red spots were versus the newer um, more suburb type um, housing that's towards the outside of the city and that's where we see those green and blue areas so the city layout still has um, very a lot of similarities from the original redlining map and that map was from I believe 1932 that we saw um, and considering that we still see those effects today um, is pretty significant so um, housing discrimination in the United States, it is illegal to discriminate on the basis of race. So we had the Fair Housing Act of 19, 1968, um, and that made it illegal to discriminate in housing based on race or class or anything. So um, before that, previously, agents would steer people into neighborhoods based on race, um, and they would actually associate black people with words like lazy, irresponsible, financial risk, um, poor, low class, that sort of thing. And then similarly, Latinx people would be associated with undocumented, hardworking, low income, illiterate, or family oriented. So a lot of very stereotypical words um, were associated with these communities versus white people were associated with affluent, responsible, high achieving, or educated, that sort of thing. Um, so real estate agents would use this and steer people in specific directions. So nearly 240 cities in the United States were redlined at one point or another. So many, this is not um, exclusive to Madison or anything, many of these red line maps are still very consistent with the demographic maps today, um, whether that's in regards to race or class. Um, they're still very, very similar today. So historically, red areas have much higher obesity rates, diabetes rates, poverty and um, minority rates than those green and blue areas. And a lot of this is due to, a lot of these health problems are due to um, low access to clean food, an abundance of liquor stores and convenience stores, fast food, um, that sort of thing that all contribute to diabetes and obesity. Um, and there's just, um, that's also just contributing to those health problems that you see, as well as those minorities being in those areas. That's why you don't see as many minorities in those green and blue areas because they had never previously been there. So they still are not there except for the, um, smaller fraction of people that actually did migrate to those greener and bluer areas. Um, so this is not only due to poor living conditions, but it's just that low access and then those overcrowded buildings as well where we see more spreads of more spread of diseases. So in those small apartments where people are living on top of each other, that's where we see higher cases of COVID-19 or in like the 1900s, that's where you'd see a lot of people getting like tuberculosis and things like that. Um, just from living on top of each other um, in those spaces. So in Philadelphia, for instance, a study was compared for, to a 1937 HOLC map to modern day. So the study was done in 2014 and it showed that the highest concentration of violence and firearm usage was in previously redlined areas. So the highest concentration of violence was in previously redlined areas. And this is extremely telling because people are um, people are forced to live in housing that they can afford. So if they're forced to live in these areas that were previously redlined um, and are still like seeing those effects of that redlining, that means they're not, it's a safety issue at this point. It's not even a health issue. It's a safety issue because they're exposed to this violence on a daily basis in um, this housing that they are forced to live in because it's all they can really afford. Um, and that was done in 2014 in one city, considering there was probably very similar cases all across the United States. Um, like this was not, this is not exclusive to Pennsylvania by any means. So um, even with all of these problems, there have been efforts to try to fix them. 
but they have still proven to be problematic. And Edward Goetz goes into four main reasons that um, these uh, issues are still pretty problematic. So number one, these programs are aimed, aimed at desegregation. They don't cater to the people that they're assisting. They're just kind of claiming to help. They're not actually going into depth on what these people need for help. And these programs always, number two, always try to assimilate people of color into white communities rather than trying to assimilate white communities into communities of color. So then it's just kind of um, leaving these people to fend for themselves in new environments. And similarly, there's little evidence to support that forced integration actually reduces white racism. So these people are, of color are going into these new neighborhoods and they're experiencing this racism that they likely didn't see as much of in their community um, previously. Um, and they're just kind of forced to deal with it without any any real help on how to navigate that. And then lastly, by focusing on integration and less on community development, conditions tend to stay the same for minorities and low income families. So um, things aren't actually help, aren't actually changing if we're only focus, focusing on integration. That's If that's the main concern, um, then we're kind of looking at this wrong. We actually have to work on how, how do we integrate? How do we get people of different communities to coexist better, um, that sort of thing. And like, how can we as a community grow and um, learn how to be respectful of other cultures and ethnicities and that sort of thing. So that's really important when discussing integration as far as housing goes as well. So let's talk about Madison specifically. Um, so I have a quote here that I'm gonna read. It says that racial zoning accounted for the fact that in 1940, 80% of Madison's small black population lived in only three of the city's 20 wards. Nearly 60% of black residents lived in the ninth ward alone. Ninth ward was on the south side. So concentrated on the city's south side near railroad yards, foundries, and other heavy industries. So the majority, when black people first started kind of arriving in Madison, the majority of them were actually on the south side, like I, um, I had said before, in those redlined areas. And they're next to all these industries, all this pollution, um, like loud noise, such as like railroads. And that is contributing to like health problems such as asthma, for example, like we saw in New York and other health problems as well. Um, Madison doesn't have a large black population to begin with, but it has con continued to grow since the 1960s and it's gotten increasingly bigger. Um, but again, they most of the black people in Madison tend to stay towards the east side, towards the north south side, um, and less towards the west side. A lot of the black students that we see in west um, west side high school or um, schools are from lower income communities, um, from like the south sides and that sort of thing. And there aren't as many high income black students on the west side. So the medium income in historically redlined neighborhoods in Madison, the South Side specifically, but historically redlined income is around $26,000, which is 49% lower than the national average. So you can, that is not, it's not a coincidence that these areas have that a significantly low medium income. It's because of redlining, because there's been a repeating cycle of that. And we're seeing um, these people who are likely working minimum wage jobs or slightly above minimum wage, and it's barely enough um, to live a sufficient life. So in my experience in Madison, um, a lot of stuff that I have learned in my 21 years of being here and um, I've picked up on from being in school and that sort of thing is that there are, I can say with certainty, that there are many similarities between the HOLC map that represented Madison compared to today. So today, black people in Madison are primarily concentrated in poor neighborhoods. So like I said, um, there just aren't, there, there aren't very many high income black families on the west side and there certainly aren't very many on the east side considering most of the east side and south side areas were yellow and red areas. Um, so on the east side, there are primarily yellow and red zones. So of the two east side high schools, we have East High School and La Follette High School, which I went to. There was only one wealthy neighborhood that flowed into either of the high schools, and that was Maple Bluff, which is on the lake, these really large, gorgeous houses on the lake, and that flowed into East High School. There was no wealthy neighborhoods that flowed into La Follette High School, whereas the West Side, which had newer green and blue areas, um, they had 
um, they have most of the wealthy students going into their high schools. So over time, the West Side has gained more affluent neighborhoods. We see most of those newer neighborhoods on the West Side, and you can kind of see it expanding towards the East Side a little bit more. It's not quite as affluent as the Far West Side is, but you can see that it's growing and it's getting newer towards the Far East Side, but it's still not quite there since those are brand new neighborhoods, whereas the West Side has kind of been newer and affluent for the past decade or two. Um, so I want to talk about the Allied community as well. The Allied community is one of the city's poorest neighborhoods and has one of the highest black populations in the city. Um, so that's, again, over on the south side. And it was, of course, a previously redlined area. And the median household income of Allied is about $37,000. So a little bit more than other, um, other redlined areas. However, for black families in the Allied neighborhood, the median, in, the median income is $12,400. $12,400 is the median income for black families, which is a very high concentration of black families in the allied neighborhood. Um, and that's really telling, considering that's about $1,000 a month um, that you're earning, which is about $50 to $500 a paycheck, which really is only about minimum wage. And that is not very much, especially if you have other dependents and that sort of thing. Um, it's just not a sustainable life. And considering that that low, those low income black families are all in such a concentrated spot that was redline, you can see that effect today um, of those, of um, forcing all those people into one specific spot. So um, also what is considered to be the north side also contains some of Madison's lowest income neighborhoods. And on the map, again, those were mostly red and yellow neighborhoods and those flowed into East High School on the north side. Um, so I want also wanna talk about the city's mobile home parks, which are located on the south, two on the south side and one towards the east side. Um, but one of the trailer parks specifically is located directly across the street from the city's sewage plant. So these people are in one of the most environmentally undesirable locations in the city, considering it is directly across the street from the sewage plant. And for people who are living in low income housing, they're not doing it necessarily out of choice it's more that they have to live in a place that they can afford and the fact that the city chose to place this affordable housing in such an undesirable location is really telling on how much um, we as a society respect um, low-income folks and the lack of respect that society has for people um, because if they could live somewhere else they likely would but just the fact that they're that is where the city chose to put their housing is very telling on how much we respect the working class and it's extremely frustrating. So um, to further keep going with this, the city's homeless population is primarily downtown and towards the north and east sides as well. Again, those red and yellow areas. And then also the most affordable grocery stores in the city are on the far west or far east side. So you're not seeing Woodman's, which is the affordable grocery store. You're not seeing that on the north and south side. So you're on the north and south side, you're seeing a lot of liquor stores, a lot of fast food, um, convenience stores, corner stores, that sort of thing. And like I was saying before, that is the type of, type of stuff that contributes to obesity, diabetes, or those negative habits such as addiction. You see a lot of tobacco outlets as well in those areas. And um, even the grocery stores that are on the north and south side, those are more of those expensive um, grocery stores and there's less access to that cheaper but fresh produce um, that people need to have clean eating. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that contributes to how um, Madison is um, still dealing with those effects of redlining and how people who are kind of getting stuck in that repeating cycle of it, um, how they have to deal with the lingering effects of that. So these are not unique to Madison at all. There, it is very notable in cities such as Milwaukee, Detroit is really bad, Baltimore, Chicago, and other metropolitan, metropolitan cities, especially in the North, where you're seeing smaller minority communities, um, you're especially seeing that redlining and seeing that high concentration in specific neighborhoods. Um, and there's many causes that have led up to the situation that we have today. The HOLC maps, um, which gave way to redlining, that was a big part of it. The Fair Housing Act, which didn't integrate neighborhoods, it just made it illegal to discriminate 
on the basis of housing, but it did not, it did nothing to actually integrate those neighborhoods. And then similarly, outlawing discrimination did not change financial status. Um, people still could afford the same housing that they could have already previously afforded, which again, continued to be in those redlined areas, which prompted that cycle even further. And few studies have actually gone to show the true effects of redlining today, but it's a growing research topic. Um, people are taking more interest in it because it is so prominent. I Like I said, New York, um, Pitts, or Philadelphia, Madison, you can see it so clearly. There's evidence of it very clearly, and people are starting to pick up on that and research it as well. And these problems go past the homes as well. Like I said, less quality. Um, access to quality food, more diseases that are spread when people are living on top of each other, such as COVID-19, um, and just those higher health problems like obesity and diabetes. Um, it's that, that housing is actually having true health effects on people. Um, and it's a real problem. It is a real problem. And it, it's going to take a long time to fix, but there needs to be steps in place to start making those efforts to, if we really want to see the complete abolition of redlining. So if we continue to allow discriminatory history to dictate the quality of life for people of the United States without proper intervention, the maps displaying communities across Madison and the United States will continue to reflect a racist agenda from the 1930s and we will not see true progress. Thank you for listening. Bye.